give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord it's your breath and our lungs so we pour Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness 
darkness watch and pray Find in me thine all in all Cause Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow You were 
unforgiven Because you were forsaken And I'm accepted You were condemned And I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again Well, good day to you. My name is Sean, and I'm the pastor here at Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. I'm so glad that you are here with us. You might be fellowshipping with us through broadcast, but we consider you an important member of our Calvary Chapel, Birmingham family. So it's good to have you with us. While you're here, do me a favor, and if you haven't already, click subscribe. And ring that bell so that you are notified whenever a new video is posted. Also, if you could share this video with your friends and family, that would help us to put faithful Bible teaching into the hands of even more people. I know that many of you give when you are able to attend church. But please continue to give to the church even when you are unable to be here in person with us. Being a small church, giving tends to be small in amount and, well, sparse. But if you don't give, we can't afford rent, we can't afford utilities, and we will be unable to broadcast as we do. Without being here at the church, there are several ways you can give. You can give by mail, either set up an automatic uh, contributions through your bank or perhaps a bill pay service or you can mail it directly here. Our address is Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, 1738 Morgan Park Road, Pelham, Alabama, 35124. Checks can be made out to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Or you can give online at www.calvarybirmingham.com. In the menu at the top of the page, just click on giving, and it will take you to a page where you can give a one-time gift or you can commit to a scheduled gift. Please pray about 
giving into this ministry so we can continue to faithfully teach God's Word as we have always done. Our study of 1 Peter 1 with verse 13. Um, and we, we also have agape feast today after service, so I'll be careful not to go too long. I wore my Italian themed shirt for today. I don't know if there will be any pizza or not. But. All right, so last week in verses 6 through 12, Peter, the author of this letter, pointed out that as believers, we can have a certain view of suffering. That's because while our trials are many, they're varied, we're all experiencing different things in life, um, God's grace is sufficient. God's grace meets our needs in every way. God matches the trials to us, the trials that we experience. He us, he knows what we are able to handle. He knows what we need. And he matches those trials to us according to his grace. Jesus spoke to his disciples in John 16, saying, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. So the disciples could have peace in what Jesus said. Why? I mean, he was telling them about some difficult things that were ahead. They could have peace because Jesus spoke of the gospel. And we can have peace because the words of Jesus, they've been fulfilled in him. And we know that our end, if we are in Christ, if we have received Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, then our end is salvation. So that is one of God's many or manifold graces. We can be confident in the end, our salvation. We also learned to find confidence in the reason for our suffering. God has a plan for it. Trials are controlled by God. And they don't last forever. Our trying experiences today, those things we endure today, they are preparing us for the glory He has set aside for us tomorrow. Faith 
endures the fires of persecution. So then, our faith is a, it's a present and it's a powerful truth that can turn today's suffering into glory. Paul said that we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. Romans 8.28 Notice there that he didn't say we all see all things working together for good because we often don't see things working together for good. Sometimes, perhaps many times, perhaps most times, we have a very hard time seeing today's problems yielding anything good. But instead, in Romans 8, Paul wrote that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. And if there is anybody that would have liked to have been able to see all things working together for good, it certainly would have been the Apostle Paul who suffered so much for the sake of the Gospel. Said, he said, we know all things. And that speaks of belief. That speaks of faith. Peter also wrote in verse 8 that we have not seen Jesus and yet we love Him. This Christian life Even though we have many trials, even though there may be persecution that we're enduring in some way, though certainly not to the extent of many Christians, speaking of us today, many Christians around the world experience far more persecution. I mean, being made fun of it at school or at work or wherever, that's nothing compared to what most Christians around this world are experiencing. And yet, our trials to us are really hard. They're difficult. And yet, the Christian life can be wonderful now in what we're enduring, in what we're experiencing even though there are trials, even though there might be persecution. Paul, again quoting Paul in Romans 5, he said, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we, we have a couple of things. We have faith. We know that all things work together for good those who love God or the called according to his purpose and now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us so we have faith and we have love faith and love together Strengthen hope. They give us confidence for the future. Hope which is strengthened by putting our hearts and our minds on Christ. Or we could make it very simple and say by focusing on Jesus. Trust in the Lord. Rejoice in Him. And you can receive from Him all that we need turn all these difficulties that we face, all the bitter trials, into joyful victory. Last week we talked in depth about all of that. Um, so, some really good news, really good stuff that we looked at last week. 
And we wrapped up with verses 10 through 12 where we learned that the Old Testament prophets, they wrote about this salvation. And they studied closely what God revealed to them. They saw the sufferings of the Messiah and also the glory that would come after. But they did not have all the information to fully understand the connection between these things. They were then ministering the things that Peter says in verse 12 are things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. As Christians today, we have an advantage over the Old Testament prophets. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, and He is our helper. He indwells us and He seals us to the day of redemption. He guarantees our salvation. He works to regenerate and to renew us. He comforts us with fellowship and with joy. He teaches us. He enables us to understand these things that we are reading in Scripture. You, have you ever gone to a friend who doesn't know Jesus and, and read to them from the Bible and they're like, I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. And yet to you, it's like, this is simple. This, this makes all the sense in the world. The Holy Spirit reveals these things to you and opens you up to understand God's Word. He sanctifies us. We are set apart as belonging to God. But He also works in us, renewing us, generating us, working in us so that we are progressively sanctified in our lives. He gifts us with spiritual gifts according to His wisdom. And all these things are tremendous advantages over those Old Testament prophets. But the book of Hebrews points out to us many of which suffered horribly for the, the truth that they knew and they proclaimed. And yet, we have a more full understanding of this truth. We have another advantage over them. And even over the first Christians, the early Christians, those that Paul was writing this letter to. We have the complete Word of God. We have the complete canon of Scripture. The whole Bible. It is perfect in its completeness. It is completeness. It is lacking nothing. It is the written Word of God. You want to hear from God, open up your Bible and read. You want to hear audibly from God, read your Bible aloud. Or ask someone to read it to you. <laughs> this, this is a treasure that is so often neglected, even in Christian circles. It's a treasure that, that sits on shelves. Because so many would prefer to go and listen to somebody talk about their life experiences than just read the Bible and expound on what it says. That's what the apostles would call tickling the ears. This treasure absolutely should not be neglected. And, and we won't. <laughs> We're not going to neglect going to neglect it. So let's let's pray and, and we'll continue our verse by verse study through the Bible. Lord, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you died on the cross for our sins and Lord, that by grace through faith we are saved. 
Um, not because of works that we do, not because we earn it in any way or we merit in it, it in any way, Lord. And we thank you, Father, that we can't demerit it. We ask, Lord, to, that you would work in us to open our hearts to receive from you everything that you would say to us this morning through your written word. And we desire to be hearers and doers. We ask that you would lead us in all your ways. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, so we pick it up with verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Uh, I'm sorry, of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Girding up loins is not, that's not a phrase we hear often these days. Um, we'll get to that in a second. First, let's look at that word rest. In verse 13, rest your hope. Better translated, it would be set your hope. Or as we find it in the ESV, very good translation, the English standard, standard version, fix your hope. Um, the New American Standard Bible is another, another very literal translation. Um, where it says fix your hope. Uh, the Greek is actually a single word that means to hope expectantly. Um, elpizo. Hope. But looking towards something. To hope because you expect. Not to hope because you just kind of wish. This is to hope because you've got knowledge of something that is true. Now it's modified by this other word uh, teleos, which means completely. So then, this hope is full. Or we might, we might put it this way. We might say, hey, don't hedge your bets. Place all of your hope on God's grace. Ahead of this, Peter says, therefore, and that, of course, points us back to what he said before this, which... Uh, we just reviewed in the introduction, though certainly simply and briefly, um, we might say, uh, because of all these reasons that have been presented to us to have hope, let us hope completely. In other words, let us not have this one category of things that we're going to place our hope in, and let us have this other category just in case that we place our hope in. We place all our hope. Everything. In Christ. The phrase, gird up the loins, spoke of uh, taking one's tunic and tucking it up between the legs into one's belt, which allowed for easier movement, more freedom of movement. And Peter here, he applies this to the mind. It's essentially an idiom that means be prepared in every way possible to follow Christ. When you rest your thoughts on the return of Christ and, and live accordingly, you escape many of the worldly things that would hinder you. By means of example, Consider how later in verse 19, he identifies Christ, Peter identifies Christ as the Passover lamb. Now, according to the Lord's instructions in Exodus 12, the Jews at Passover were supposed to eat the Passover meal in haste. And what were they to be? They were to be ready to move. Being sober here means self-controlled. Putting together all these things. And a very literal translation of this verse could be something like this. Therefore, when you have prepared your minds for action by being self-controlled, put your hope completely in the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now the revelation of Jesus Christ 
is another expression for the living hope and the appearing of Jesus Christ. You know, Christians, we live in the future tense. But Peter earlier pointed us toward the end of your faith. And then here he says, set your hope. So then, present actions, what we do now, present decisions, what we decide now, should be governed by what we know to be the future. And that future is this future hope that Peter speaks of. That future hope is salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. We live with the expectation of seeing Jesus Christ. We live with the expectation that there will be a day where we will be before our Lord and our Savior. Present. Peter said, before this, whom having not seen, you have loved. Now he speaks of that day when we are before our Lord. And we are seeing Him. But more than that, much more than that, we'll get to that in a moment. What, what Peter has been doing to this point is emphasizing walking in hope. Now, his, his emphasis is now moving us towards walking in holiness. The squeaky stage right there. Walking, us in, walking in holiness. It's not squeaky over here. That's weird. I'll do the Charleston up. Um, we're we're going to see all of this better as we move into verses 14, uh, 15, of course, 16, in which Peter quotes from God from several places in Leviticus. Um, and he says, Be holy, for I am holy. Which to me is scary. <laughs> think that but for now understand that the two hope and holiness they do go together first john uh, three first john three verse three says and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he speaking of christ is pure the greek word for holy is ios and it essentially speaks of being different it speaks of being distinct israel was was called to be holy as god was holy and, and thus to to live in a manner that was distinct from the ways of all the other nations that were around them god himself is holy meaning he is separated from sin and he is devoted to seeking his own honor the, the furniture of the tabernacle was constructed and consecrated as being holy, meaning it was separate from ordinary and evil use. And it was devoted to honoring and to glorifying God. The idea of holiness for God's people includes not simply a concept of being just separate but a specifically moral sense of separation from evil and instead dedication to a life of righteousness. It's a new pattern of life. It's not like the old pattern. It's different. And the believer is different. His life has a quality about it that is different. His present lifestyle is not only different from the past way of life, it's different from the lifestyles of the unbelievers who are around him. People who used to know you might say, what happened to them? People who see you now say, what's up with her? As Peter says later in chapter 4, a Christian's life of holiness appears strange to the lost. But it's not strange to other believers. 
course, we, we all know that, that living in this world and maintaining a holy walk is not something that is easy. God has separated us from this world, but this world wants to conform us to itself. Like in the movie The Godfather, you know, when they when I get out, they drag me back. You know. A Christian who is looking for the glory of God has a, a greater motivation for present obedience than a Christian who is ignoring the fact that the Lord is coming again. And this is well illustrated in the lives of Abraham and Lot. Abraham had his eyes of faith on that heavenly city, which is what uh, Hebrews 11 speaks of, the hall of faith where Abraham is brought up. He had his eyes on that heavenly city. He had no interest in the world's real estate, I guess you could say. But Lot, he looked out the plains of the Jordan. He moved towards Sodom. Abraham brought blessings to his home. What came to Lot's home? Judgment. Not only should we have a disciplined mind, but we should have, Peter says, a sober mind. That is self-controlled. Now, some people get way carried away with this idea. They become very legalistic to the point of setting aside grace instead of resting their hope fully on grace. Others become so focused with the idea of what Paul, what, what Peter says is the revelation of Christ that they lose their spiritual balance because they start focusing on prophetic studies and they ignore being living testimonies today. The fact that Christ is coming, that should encourage us be calm and collected. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. The fact that Satan is on the prowl, that is another reason to be sober-minded. And, and, and Peter will get to this in chapter 5 saying, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. Not only should we have a prepared mind, we should have a sober mind. And we should have a hopeful mind. A believer can rest his hope fully upon the grace. The grace of God. And that means not only a good outlook on life, it means a good uplook. We can have a good outlook on life because we know our Savior, as we read just earlier, has overcome the world. And we know that, as Peter has already said, the end of your faith is the salvation of your souls. The result of this spiritual mindset is that a believer experiences the grace of God in this life. We don't live cowering in fear because Jesus could come back at any minute. Instead, we're prepared. We're sober-minded. We are at rest in His manifold graces that can forgive our sins, meet our every failing, and our every need. We've been saved by grace, and we depend moment by moment on God's grace not by the merits of works. As Titus 2, 10-13 details out for us, looking for Christ to return strengthens our faith and hope in difficult days. 
The grace of God brings salvation. And it teaches us to say no to unholy things because we have better things to look toward. Verse 14. Now let me back up so I, I keep this in context here. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Holy. So the argument here is, is really very simple and very logical. Children inherit the nature of their parents. And I'm not talking about hair color, eye color, mannerisms, and those kinds of things. I, I, Paul touched on this in his letter to the, to the Roman believers. There in chapter 5, Paul wrote, Therefore, in verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death, death spread to all men because all sin." What began with Adam was handed down through the generations of all men. But then speaking of salvation by grace, Paul says in verse 15 of Romans 5, But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by one. And the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And then in verse 17, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 6, continuing this whole line of reasoning, Paul says, and do, not present yourself, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Put very simply, as, Paul, as Peter does here, God is holy, therefore as his children... We should live holy lives. In his second letter, Peter wrote that we are partakers of the divine nature and ought to reveal that nature in godly living. Now, back to verse 14 of this chapter, Peter reminded his readers of what they were they, before with their lusts and their ignorance. That is, before they trusted Christ. Paul used the phrase sons of disobedience uh, in Ephesians 2 where he said, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the, the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So, they had been children of disobedience with those evil cravings. They had been imitators of the world. Uh, Paul used the phrase, conform to this world in Romans 12. Fashioning themselves after the standards and the pleasures of the world. But now, they were to be obedient children. If you take a look at the, the unsaved world, you will notice that, that while the unsaved say they want to be free and different, they all imitate one another. Ignorance here is uh, agnuia. And in this context, it speaks of sinful ignorance. Peter is speaking of the lack of knowledge that leads to sinful behavior. It's causative, leading to indulgence. The unsaved lack spiritual understanding. 
And this causes them to give themselves to all manner of fleshly and worldly indulgences. Peter said in Ephesians 4, that the, or Paul said in Ephesians 4, that the Gentiles, meaning the unsaved world, walk in the futility of their mind. As we noted before, we were born with a fallen nature that's been handed down to us from Adam. So then it was natural for us to live sinful lives. And, and if it were not for the grace of God, we would still be in that situation. But we can claim no part in it. Verse 15 says, He called us. He called us. Just as the disciples responded by faith to Jesus when He said, follow Me. And they responded by faith to His call. And He completely changed their lives. Perhaps this explains why Peter used the word called so many times in this letter. In verse 15, Peter says we are called to be holy. In verse 9 of chapter 2, Peter said we are called out of darkness into His marvelous light. In verse 21 of chapter 2, we are called to suffer and follow Christ's example of meekness. In verse 9 of chapter 3, we are called to inherit a blessing. And in verse 10 of chapter 5, best of all, we are called to who is eternal glory. The Bible is very clear that God called us before we called on Him for salvation. It's all, all of it, every bit of it, holy, completely, full of grace. But God's gracious election of sinners Become saints always involves responsibility. It's not just privilege. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 that He has chosen us in Christ that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. God has called us to Himself and He is holy. Therefore, we should be holy. Peter quoted from the Old Testament law, which says this in several places in Leviticus. He, he does this to back up his admonition here. And we find this in both Testaments, old and new, because God's holiness is an essential and unchanging part of his nature. Peter says, it is written. It is written. Be holy for I'm all. That's a statement that should carry great authority for any believer that it's written. The Bible reveals God's mind. And so we should learn it. The Bible, the Bible reveals God's heart. So we should love it. The Bible reveals God's will. So we should live it. Now I should point out here that Peter's quote from the Old Testament law does not mean that Christians today who are under grace are still under law. That would contradict much of the Bible. God has not changed His mind about sin. But God has purposed to save us by grace through faith in His Son Jesus Christ rather than by the works of the law. And that is wonderful because we are unable to keep the law as it has to be kept perfectly. But Jesus kept the law perfectly. And He paid the penalty for our sins, past, present, and future, so that in Him we can be saved. Not by works of the law, but by grace through faith. And Paul explained in 2 Corinthians, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We were born with a fallen nature. And so any holiness that we have in character and conduct, conduct have to be derived from Him. Now, think back to all the calls that uh, I noted are found here in 1 Peter. Called to be holy. 
called out of darkness into his marvelous light, called to suffer and follow Christ's example of meekness, called to inherit a blessing, called to eternal glory. All these things point to our sanctification. Now to be sanctified means to be set apart for God's exclusive use and his exclusive pleasure. It involves separation from that which is unclean. It involves complete devotion to God. And we take the point of view that all of life is holy as we live to glorify God. Even the mundane activities, as Paul even wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. So then, a good answer to that question that we probably each ask ourselves quite a bit, should I do this, is if something cannot be done to the glory of God, then we can be sure that it must be out of the will of God. We are sanctified by God when we're saved. The Holy Spirit then resides in us. And the Holy Spirit seals us to the Lord. And we are no longer as the world. We are sanctified from the world. And then there is this idea of progressive sanctification. And this happens as we are led by the Spirit of God. And we are conformed to the image of Christ. And it's completed in that day when we, as Peter put it, receive the end of our salvation, uh, the end of our faith, that is salvation. Verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Fear there is that is the Greek word phobos, and, and it means dread and terror. I had a dream the other night where I woke up angry. I had a dream where I was in a, in a house. Christy and I were in an, another house, and I hate spiders. And, and there were these big, huge spiders building nests in the corners, all the corners of the house. And Christy wanted to catch the spiders and put them outside instead of killing them. And I was so mad in that dream because I wanted to just burn down the house. Like, never mind this. Burn it with fire. So I was experiencing that dream. I was experiencing dread and terror. Phobos. The thing is, the fear here, it points back to the Father. who it says, without partiality, judges. Now, for the unsaved, there is then terror, dread and terror, because the judge can destroy the soul. For the saved, when the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation. It's not dread and terror. Rather, it is awe-inspiring reverence. It's not fear of judgment. It's sober reverence of the Father. Our Holy Father, is He is holy and He is righteous. And the Bible tells us that He does not change. He will not compromise with sin. And He is merciful. And forgiven. He is a loving disciplinarian who does not permit his children to enjoy sin. After all, it was sin that sent his son to the cross. Now, as we noted earlier in our study, if we call God Father, then we reflect his nature. Uh, Check out that phrase in, in verse 17 the Father without Partiality judges according to each one's work. 
Now, what is this judgment that Peter wrote about? Is it... What is it? It's the, it's the judgment of a believer's works. It has nothing to do with salvation. Except that salvation ought to produce good works. When we trusted Christ, God forgave us of our sins and He declared us righteous in His Son. Colossians 2.13 says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having, having forgiven you all trespasses. Our sins have already been judged on the cross and therefore they cannot be held against us. But when the Lord returns, there will be a time of judgment that's called the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible speaks of it in multiple places. Romans 14, 2 Corinthians 5. Each one of us will give account of his own works and each will receive the appropriate reward. Now as opposed to a sinner's judgment, you can think, this, think of this as more of a family judgment. The father dealing with his children. The Greek word translated judge is, is krino, and it carries this meaning of a judgment based upon the value of something. In other words, it's to judge in order to find something good. God is going to examine the hearts. He will examine our works. But his purpose is to glorify himself in our lives and our ministries. And that for the purpose that each one's praise will come from God. Now what about the without partiality part? Um, there are many gifts and privileges that, that God might give to His children. Some might be spiritual. Others might be practical things. What God will not do is give us the privilege to sin. God does not pamper. God does not indulge. The Bible says that He is impartial and that He is no respecter of persons. Romans 2.11 says there is no partiality with God. He never pampers His children or indulges them. Many years of obedience do not mean you have earned a free year of disobedience. When a child of God disobeys, God disciplines that child. But when his child obeys and serves him in love, God also notes that and prepares a reward. The reverent awe that, that Peter spoke of before this is due to the fact that the Father lovingly disciplines His children today and will judge their works in the future. It's not fear of judgment. Remember what Paul wrote in Romans 8, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God's judgment of His children is about revealing the good by burning away what isn't. Instead, this, this, this reverent fear is it, not of the judgment. It's of disappointing Him or sinning against His love. Verse 18. Oh, back up to verse 17. Stay in context. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here on here in fear knowing that you were not redeemed with uh, corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Of all motives for holy living, redemption is certainly the highest. 
So Peter reminded his readers about their salvation and the price that was paid for it. This is a reminder that we all need. And that, that's one reason why the Lord established what we call communion with the Lord's Supper. Peter starts out reminding them of what they were. To begin with, they were slaves who needed to be set free. They needed to be redeemed. Now, redemption tends to be something that we consider theologically these days. But to the people who are living in the time that Peter was writing this letter, it had a very specific meaning. There were probably 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. And most of them were laborers. Many slaves became Christians and they fellowshiped in the local assemblies. Now, a slave in that time could purchase his own freedom if they were able to collect enough money to do so. Or his master could sell him to someone who would pay the price and then had the option of setting them free. And that would be redemption. Redemption to those who were slaves was a very precious thing in that day. Now that kind of slavery still exists today around the world, but for most of us, we don't see it. Or perhaps we just don't recognize it. But there is a slavery that we do all see. And it's in our, fr it's in our families. Our friends are in bondage to it. Our co-workers, people we pass day to day in the mall or wherever. We should never forget the slavery of sin from which we in Christ have been set free. In the Old Testament, Recorded in Deuteronomy, Moses urged Israel to remember that they had been slaves in Egypt. But that generation of Israel forgot the bondage that they experienced, and they wanted to go back. And while we must not forget that there are many who are slaves of sin, it's important that we it's important to remember that we were once slaves to sin. Not only did we have a life of slavery, but it was also a life of emptiness. Paul refers to it here as aimless conduct. Peter says, this empty way of life was received by tradition from your fathers. Now this isn't Peter saying that traditions, in other words, ancient Jewish traditions or church traditions or scriptural doctrines, things like that, that these things are bad. Peter's not even talking about that kind of tradition. The tradition from your fathers is speaking of the sin nature that has been handed down from generation to generation. Aimless conduct by tradition from your fathers. Peter described this empty living more specifically in chapter 4, where he said, uh, he described it as lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking. Uh, drinking parties and abominable idolatries. Before they received the gospel, these people thought their lives were full and happy. But they were really empty and they were miserable. Just like unsaved people and even backslidden people today while remembering what we were is good, it's also good to be reminded of what Christ did. He redeemed us. To redeem is to be set free by paying a price. A slave back then to be freed with the payment of money. 
At the same time, there was no amount of money that could set a sinner free of their sins. And so Peter says, you are not redeemed with corruptible things. Things that we would consider to be of value today. Silver, gold. Those things, they could not ever in a million years redeem us. But God commanded Moses in Leviticus 17 saying, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Only the blood of Jesus Christ, whom the sacrifices foreshadowed, can redeem us. He shed His precious blood to purchase us out of that slavery that we were in that slavery to sin, and set us free forever. In chapter 5, Peter records that he was a witness of Christ's suffering. And he mentions Jesus' sacrificial death about six times in this letter. But here, he calls Christ a lamb. Peter was reminding his readers of, of an Old Testament teaching that was important in the early church. And it really ought to be important to us today. And it's not, you know, observing the Passover. A Christian is certainly welcome to do that if they wish. I'm talking about the doctrine of substitution. That is an innocent victim giving his life for the guilty. We see this doctrine in Scripture begin in Genesis 3 when God killed animals to clothe Adam and Eve. Then a ram died in the place of Isaac in Genesis 22. The Passover lamb was slain for each Jewish household in Exodus 12. Sacrifices required by the law of Moses also pictured that future sacrifice of Christ. In Isaiah 53, the Messiah was presented as an innocent lamb. Now back in Genesis 22, Isaac asked the question of his father, where is the lamb? In 1 John 1, John the Baptist. He answered that question. He pointed to Jesus. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Of course, Revelation chapter 5 tells us that in heaven both the redeemed and the angels sing worthy is the Lamb. And here's the thing, guys. Christ's death was an appointment. It wasn't an accident. In verse 20, Peter says it was foreordained before the foundation of the world and manifest in these last times. In Peter's speech of Acts 2, he said that Jesus was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. While it was man who betrayed Jesus and had Him crucified, it was God who determined it. And it was Jesus who laid down His life for you and I. But He didn't stay dead. He was raised from the dead. And now anyone who trusts in Him will be saved for all eternity. As Peter says, so that your faith and hope are in God. When you and I think on the sacrifice of Christ on, on our behalf to redeem us, we should want to obey God and to live holy lives. And that not to, to try to add in our own merit to the mix. Look what I'm able to do. Look what I've figured out. It's because we have been set apart 
as his. And we're being sanctified for his glory. Verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. This is one of those instances where the chapter breaks do not fall in an ideal location. There is one Greek word here that is translated as love of the brethren. That word is Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. In addition, the best manuscripts do not have that phrase that we have here in the New King James Version where it says, through the Spirit. So then, what would be a better translation here of verses 22 and 23 would be something like this. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth For sincere brotherly love, love one another fervently from the heart because you have been born again, not from perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. Here, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth simply reminds us that Peter is speaking into those who are saved. Put more simply, it would mean, since you have been purified, love one another because you have been. And then to add emphasis, Peter repeats himself. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. Only the second time Peter uses a different word for love. He uses agape, which is God-like sacrificial love. You know, by nature, all of us are selfish. And it took a miracle of God to give us this love. Having obeyed the gospel, God purified our souls. And as Paul says in Romans 5, God poured His love into our hearts. And this love we are to show toward one another who are of the body of faith. Sacrificially, sincerely, and fervently. Now according to 1 John uh, 4, love for the brethren is an evidence that we have truly been born of God. We have been born again into the same family. The family of God. And there should be love between people of God. As Jesus himself taught in John 3, the only way to enter God's spiritual family is by a spiritual birth through faith in him. Now, as I said earlier, the new birth gives to us a new nature as well as a new and living hope. Our first birth was a birth of the flesh. The flesh is corruptible. Whatever is born of flesh is destined to die and to decay along with the works of the flesh. Like the, the, the beautiful flowers, man's work, it looks great for a season. But works don't last. They decay and they die. Likewise, any creation, including any union, that is based on the first birth cannot last. Unity in the church can only remain true if it is based on second birth, that is, the new birth. We all trusted in the same gospel. We have the same Holy Spirit dwelling within us. 
We call Him the same Father and we share in His divine nature and we trust the same Word. That Word is eternal. And yes, we still have externals of the flesh that could divide us if we allow that nature to rule us. But that flesh means nothing when compared to the eternals of the Spirit that unite us. Now Peter, of course, as I said, this is a bad place for a chapter break, but Peter continues his thought in chapter 2 and we don't have time for it this morning, so we'll move into chapter 2 next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank You for this time that we've had together studying Your Word, worshiping. We thank You that You are faithful. We thank You that Your mercies are new every morning. We ask that You would increase our love for one another. That You would establish us in all good things. Lord, protect us from the evil one. Protect us from his deception. Thank you that these trials that we endure, Lord, we thank you that you are growing us through. That by grace you see us through. We ask that you would be glorified in our trials. Lord, we we place ourselves before you to do your will. We ask that you would lead us in victory. Use us to spread the knowledge of Jesus Christ to those who are unsafe. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace, His shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven and to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, Don't put it off. Take this moment to confess Jesus.